In a few weeks, a number of us here, four of us all together, are going to be participating in an event in Auburn called the Great Race. And the Great Race is a fun competition that's held every year here in Auburn. The event is um, running, cycling, and paddling. And we're going to be participating. Laura is going to be doing the running. She's going to run um, six mi six how much? Six point two miles. She looks concerned. She was ready for six miles, but that point two I think is throwing her now. And then Dylan is going to cycle twenty two miles, and then Mike and I are going to canoe four miles. It's a relay, so. She, Laura will start it off and she'll run and then she'll hand it off to Dylan and he'll bike and then he'll hand it off to Mike and we'll canoe. Um, it's just a fun event. Now some people take it like, you know, they're really serious, serious out to win it. Um, Laura says she's serious out to win it. <laughs> but whether we win or not, um, and you know, I told these guys they can blame me having an old guy on their team if they don't do well. But it's mainly just for the fun of the competition. It's fun to compete in something. It is fun to compete. You know, athletic contest, when you're involved in that, there's a lot of, of things that make it fun. It's the teamwork. And, and working together on a team is, is fun and it's great learning. And then just the, the fun of competing in anything. You know, people like that, whether it's competing in a game or whether it's competing in an athletic contest. And it doesn't matter, really, whether or not we, you know, win. We're not going to win. We're not going to, I'll tell you this, okay, this is not being that. We are not going to come in first, that's for sure. There's a, lots of people doing this and lots of them that have, even if we were all in the top shape, um, we don't have the top equipment that Dylan's bike's got. He's got a top equipment. It better be for what he spent for. It. <laughs> but, you know, I don't have a racing canoe, so otherwise we probably would be like in the top five. It's not some big prize, and even whoever gets a prize, I don't think it's like they're getting a $25,000 prize or something like that. And nobody's doing it for because they're you know, looking to get a scholarship out of this or a professional career in canoeing or bicycling or whatever. People do it just for fun, just for fun. It's fun to compete. You know, it's funny though, when you think about it, you put forth a great deal of effort in any kind of athletic contest. It's, it's hard, you know, if you're really giving it your all. It's not an easy thing to run six miles or to you know, bike 22 miles or to canoe four miles. It takes a lot of effort. And that effort, that effort is something you do just for the thrill of the competition. In 1 Corinthians chapter 9, I'd like you to go there, we see in God's Word that oftentimes the idea of competing is and an illustration, an analogy that the Word of God uses to describe what our life is now. That we are in a competition. And we learn about this competition and, and what the competition is. But it's a great perspective to keep. It's a great understanding, it's a great attitude to have about life that it is a fun competition, that it is a fun competition, that there's effort involved, and that when we're working and endeavoring to serve God, when we're endeavoring to keep His Word held high and to share His Word with other people especially, that all of that is a great competition. Life itself is a contest. It's a spiritual battle. It's a, it is a spiritual contest. And that competition is one that, like it or not, you're in, so you might as well enjoy it. You're in this competition. You are in this contest. 
And it's one that ultimately the promise is we've already won. Hmm. But there's a lot to learn about it, and it's described here in 1 Corinthians chapter 9, verse 24. It says, Know ye not that they which run in a race run all, but one receiveth the prize? So run that ye may obtain. And every man that striveth for the mastery is temperate in all things. Now they do it to obtain a corruptible crown, but we an incorruptible. I therefore so run, not as uncertainly, so fight I, not as one that beateth the air, but I keep under my body and bring it into subjection, lest that by any means, when I have preached to others, I myself should be a castaway. Um, that translation in the King James can be a little difficult to, to kind of understand. And I'd like to read you a couple of other versions of this. The first one I'll read you is from the NIV of those same verses that we just read. And look at your Bible and follow along, and then I think it'll help clarify it just by a different version of it. Verse 24, Do you not know that in a race all the runners run, but only one gets the prize? Run in such a way he has to get the prize. Everyone who competes in the games goes into strict training. They do it to get a crown that will not last, but we do it to get a crown that will last forever. Therefore, I do not run like someone running aimlessly. I do not fight like a boxer beating the air. No, I strike a blow to my body and make it my slave so that after I have preached to others, I myself will not be disqualified for the prize. That's pretty good. I also like the English Standard Version. I'll read that to you. Do you know that in a race all the runners run, but only one receives the prize. So run that ye may obtain it. Okay, now I'm going to stop here and handle this as we go with, with this version. In a race, all the runners run, but only one receives a prize. You know, if you go to uh, the Olympics, only one person receives that gold medal. Somebody else gets the silver, somebody else gets the bronze, but not everybody that competes gets a prize. You know, that doesn't happen past about, the, I don't know, probably the fifth grade, right? You know, up till that time, everybody gets a prize. But when you start competing, <clears throat> the higher the competition, you find that's not the case. Everybody competes, but only one wins. Only one takes first place, that's for sure. We are encouraged to so run that we may obtain, that we may win. This contest that we're in, this contest and that contest is really what the life that God's called us to in this contest of living for him and moving his word, that in this contest that we're in, God wants us to win. Lots of people are, part of, are called to the competition. Not everybody will win. Now, it doesn't mean that only one person can win in this spiritual contest. And as many has choose to really compete and really give it their all, they can obtain the prize. But not everybody will do that. It's like where it says in the Word of God, many are called, few are chosen. God's made it available for everyone to have salvation. Not everybody will answer that call. And even amongst those who do answer that call and get born again, even amongst those who receive that gift of Holy Spirit and have eternal life, not all of those will receive prizes or rewards at the gathering together. You see, in life, everyone that confesses Jesus Christ as Lord and believes God raised him from the dead, they're all born again. They're all going to heaven. But not everybody that's getting in the door is going to get prizes and rewards when they get there. Once Jesus Christ returns for us, then, after that, we will stand 
at the bema. And the bema, the bema is the Greek word, it's the same word used for the, in the Olympic Games of old, where they received the wreaths. Rather than gold medals, they received a wreath, a crown of wreath. Okay? And they received that for winning the competition. We will stand before the Lord Jesus Christ. We will stand before God. And we will be rewarded and obtain prizes according to how we have competed in the games. Have we given it our all? God encourages us to run that we may obtain the prize. Verse 25. Every athlete exercises self-control in all things. If you're an athlete, you've got to discipline your body. You've got to have some self-control, you know. You, if you're serious about it, and you're going to compete on a high level, and you're not going to just be in the great race where you, you know, it's just a fun competition, and you, you know, want to, you need to train, especially if you're going to do some of these things. But, you know, it's not the same as somebody who is competing in the Olympics. Boy, they've got to watch everything they eat. You know, Mike, are you watching everything you eat right now? Right, <laughs> watching it go in. You know, they're concerned about their diet. They're concerned about every day getting the exercise. They're concerned about a very strict training program, right? Mm -hmm. They exercise discipline in all things, all things relative to that competition. Okay, they exercise that kind of self-control. Now, they do it, it says, to receive a perishable wreath or crown, but we an imperishable, one that's not corruptible. As much as these guys do, and all the work that they do and all the dedication, and boy, don't kid yourself, those that compete in Olympic Games or those that compete in professional athletics, they are disciplined, they are serious, they work hard at it. They work hard at it. And some of these guys, they've trained their entire lifetime. From the time they were little kids, they've worked hard at it. And they've dedicated their life to it and worked hours and hours and hours and put up with all kinds of, of pain and pushing themselves and everything that it takes to really be good. And for what? For what? For a corruptible crown. You know, a lot of them, it's nothing more than the glory of standing on that platform at the Olympics and having that medal hung around their neck. Most of them, that's the case. You've got some high-profile sports like gymnastics and skating and maybe a couple of others where, yeah, they may somehow parlay that into some monetary gain down the line, but that's not it for most of them even. And even those that do somehow manage to make a career of it, it's still a corruptible crown, isn't it? Yeah. It's one that doesn't last. Somebody was talking, I heard recently about professional football players, and most of them five years after they've played are broke. Five years after they played are broke. Yeah, and these guys make, you know, a lot of them make big bucks. Big bucks. Not everybody, but a lot of them do. And yet it's still a corruptible crown. It doesn't last. And even if they're smart and invested and have a lot of money when they retire, it's still a corruptible crown. But ours is an incorruptible. Ours is eternal. The competition that we're called to be a part of is one that the rewards, the prize is for all of eternity. All of eternity. It's not just that one moment. It's what we will have for all of eternity. It goes on to say, verse 25, verse 26, so I do not run aimlessly. I do not box as one beating the air or shadow boxing. You know, did you ever see somebody shadow boxing? They're just beating the air. Or running aimlessly, not knowing where you're going. Our competition, the contest we're in, it's one where we're scoring. We know what we're doing. We have, first of all, the discipline and the self-discipline to do this well. Now, our discipline isn't one of, you know, getting up at, you know, 5 o'clock in the morning and drinking some raw eggs and going out into the streets and running down the streets. And <laughs> You've seen the movie, most of you. Um, that's not how we train. 
now you may train that way, and I'm sure Dylan's doing that to get ready for this, and Laura's doing that. She's probably, that's her routine for running. But in terms of the, the, the spiritual contest, that's not what we do. But what do we do? What do we do to train for it? What are you doing to train to compete? What are you doing so that you have that self-control, that mastery? What are the areas of life that you need to have that in? There's something to think about, isn't it? Mm -hmm. Verse 27. But I discipline my body and keep it under control, lest after preaching to others I myself should be disqualified. Paul said he didn't want to find himself in the position that after preaching to others, after heralding them to the, to the competition, he himself would find himself disqualified. He didn't want to give the word to everybody else and them get the prize and he himself not do it. So he had some self-control. He had some willpower in this competition. What's that competition? What is the willpower he's talking about? Should we guess at it? No. Mm -hmm. How can we know? The word. We can read. We can read. We can read. We can understand a little bit right where it's written there, but we can understand more as we look at the context. Mm -hmm. And when we look at how this is used in before and in other places. Now, we won't do all of that, but we'll look at some of it. We'll keep looking at the context immediately. Look at chapter 10. Chapter 10, immediately following on this, moreover, you know, moreover, continuing along these lines, brethren, I would not that you should be ignorant how that all our fathers were under the cloud and all passed through the sea. What cloud were they under? Was it a dark cloud walking, you know? There was a little character in little Abner that had a cloud following, he walked under. Um, the cloud, it's talking about the cloud that went before them when they came out of Egypt. When Israel came out of Egypt, there was a cloud by day and a pillar of fire by night that went before them. They were all under that cloud, okay? All of them, all of Israel, they were all under that cloud. And they all passed through the sea. They were all part of that contest. You see the relationship to what we've just read? All ran. And were all baptized unto Moses in the cloud and the sea, and did all eat the same spiritual meat, and did what? All, all drink the same spiritual drink, for they drank of that spiritual rock that followed them, and that rock was Christ. All of them were called to do this. All of them were, were part of that contest, so to speak. It's a little different. But with many of them, God was not pleased, for they were overthrown in the wilderness. Not everyone obtained. Not everybody got the prize. What was the prize they were going after? Promised land. There you go. Very good. That was the prize they were going after. You see the context here? They were going after that promised land, but did they all get there? Did they all obtain it? No, no they didn't. Verse 6, now these things were our examples to the intent that we should not lust after evil things as they also, as they also lusted. Neither be ye idolaters as were some of them. As it is written, the people sat down to eat and drink and rose up to play. So these guys, if you know the record, they got caught up into idolatry. They were filled with unbelief, and they were caught up in idolatry, and because of that, they did not obtain. And that's talked about in other places too, isn't it? Yeah. How they didn't enter into God's rest because of their unbelief. The unbelief and the idolatry kept them from obtaining, and these things are written as an example to us that we would not fall after that same example of unbelief. Look at verse 11. Now all these things happen unto them for examples, and they are written for our admonition, our warning. It's, it's written as a warning to us. God wants us to be aware of this. He tells us this time and again, actually. Time and again, they're used as a bad example. Okay? <laughs> yeah. Don't make the mistake that they made. Okay? Don't fall after that same example. Learn from them. Learn from them. Uh, 
unto whom the ends of the world are come. Verse 12. Wherefore, let him that thinketh he standeth, take heed, lest he fall. There hath no temptation taken you, but such as is common to man. But God is faithful, who will not suffer, and not allow you to be tempted above that which ye are able, but will with the temptation also make a way to escape, that ye may be able to bear it. Wherefore, my beloved, my dearly beloved, flee from what? Idolatry. idolatry. Flee from idolatry. Now, these guys, when it came to idolatry, the typical way that they practiced it was they had like little idols that they would worship. Some big idols. You know, like Israel, when they were doing it, they made a golden calf. You don't see a lot of people worshiping golden calves today, do you? I haven't seen that a lot. Have you? No. You don't see a lot of people even worshiping idols that are made with their hands, although there are people that do that. But here where we live, that's not too common. Is that the only kind of idolatry there is, though? No. 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 Idolatry is anything that is placed in the proper place that God alone should occupy. If you have anything that is in that place of God other than the true God, that's, that's idolatry. That is idolatry. You can make an idol out of anything. You don't even have to worship a God to be guilty of idolatry. In fact, in our culture, that's probably the biggest idolatry is those that worship no God. Those who worship science, those who worship self, those who worship their own intellect, that's the greatest idolatry that goes on where we happen to live. And all of that idolatry is just as bad as the idols that Israel made out of, you know, gold with the golden calf. And we are encouraged to flee that. We're encouraged to be aware that we have to be sharp that we have to watch, that we have to be careful what gets in our life, that we have to watch and be vigilant and train ourselves to keep God first in our lives, first and foremost. Of all the things that we have to train ourselves to do, it's to keep God first. It's to keep God first. And then to carry out the things that God's called us to do in his word, the rule book the rules of the competition, that which is written to us. You see, God's word is given to us so that we can compete. Let's skip down a bit. Verse 23. It says, All things are lawful for me, but all things are not expedient. All things are lawful, but all things, what? Edify not. not. Let no man seek his own, but every man another's. And wealth is, is italicized and, and badly supplied. It's not seek another man's wealth. It's not like, oh, you know, I'm going to go after that guy's money. It doesn't mean it. But we're not to seek our own. We're not to just live for self. We're not to just live for self, but we're to live for others. We're to live for God, and we're to live for others. All things it says are lawful for me, but all things are not expedient. You know, we can do whatever we want in life. We have that liberty. You can do whatever you want. And if you want to live for self, you can do that. And if you want to just, you know, live the same way that everybody else out there does, then you can. But not all things are expedient. Not all things will help you to obtain that prize. We decide what we're going to do. Look at Hebrews chapter 12, another place that it talks about the race. In Hebrews 12 and verse 1, here again it's going to be referring back to Israel. Wherefore, seeing we also are compassed about with so great a cloud of witnesses, now this time we're looking at the guys that did it right. In chapter 11, right before this verse is shared, 
It talks about the example of Israel that did it right, those that believed, and the great example of believers that they were. And looking at that example, let us lay aside every weight and the sin which doth so easily beset us, and let us run with patience the race that is set before us. When you compete in a race, you don't want to carry a lot of extra weight, okay? If you're going to run, you don't want to, like, wear your army boots when you're running. And you don't want to put on a backpack filled with 40 pounds of, of extra weight when you start running that 6.2 miles. And you don't want to be, you know, carrying a bunch of stuff. And we don't want to fill the canoe with enough gear to go camping for a week if we're going to run in that race. We want to run that race without every weight. And what do we do? Verse 2, looking unto Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith, who for the joy, the what? Joy. The joy that was set before him endured the cross, despising the shame, and is set down at the right hand of the throne of God. Jesus Christ endured the cross, and he did it for the joy that was set before him. That's our example. To run this race, to, to, to compete, to give our all in the contest that we've been called to, we do it looking at the example of Jesus Christ. That word race there is, is an interesting one. Back in 1 Corinthians, it was just stadion. You get the word, I guess, stadium from it. Here, it's the word agone. The race here is agone. It means a contest. In other places, it's translated contest or contend in different ways. And it's related also to the word agonizomai, which is translated sometimes striving or other ways. But the agone is the contest. The agonizomai is the contending. We run in this race, in this contest. We give our all. We give our all. This contest is one that is worthy of us giving our all. And it's one that requires, if we're going to obtain the prize, that we do that. That we, we put out every ounce of effort. When you're tired, that you still give your all. When you don't feel like it, you still give your all. When you're not in the mood, you still give your all. When there's a need, you give your all to help. Jesus Christ gave his all. That's our example. That's our example. He gave his all. For consider him that endured such contradiction of sinners against himself, lest he be wearied and faint in your minds. If you ever feel like giving up, if you ever feel like quitting, if you ever feel like I just don't have more to give or I'm just tired, I'm just tired, think about what he gave. We have not resisted unto blood striving against sin. You know, nobody's come to us and, and laid it on the line where they've called us to, to recant and say, you know, that we no longer are serving the true God. We haven't had to do that. And it hasn't cost us stripes on our back or any, even the things that Paul went through in order to serve God, in order to move his word, in order to help others. But that's our example. That's our example. People, they give a lot for a corruptible crown. For an incorruptible crown, it's worthy of us really contending, really giving it our all. That's what God's called us to do. You know, Paul talked about at the end of his life that he had fought a good fight that he had finished his course, that he had kept the faith, and henceforth there was for him a crown that awaited him, an incorruptible crown. And that's what we want to be able to do as well, to give our all so that we can stand before that Bema, we can stand at the Bema before God and the Lord Jesus Christ and proudly receive that crown as well. Bless you.